When James Bolger was just 14 years old, he started a life of crime that would eventually result in him becoming one of the most notorious, ruthless, and wanted Boston gangsters in history. After building up one of the most violent criminal networks in the country, he fled the Boston area in 1995 and wasn't captured until 2011. A bunch of movies, TV shows, and books have been written on the man whose life was so unbelievable that it could sometimes sound stranger than fiction. Whitey was born in 1929 to an Irish Catholic family in Boston, Massachusetts. He was given the name James Joseph Bolger Jr. at birth, but preferred to be called Jimmy. He also tried to get people to call him Boots because he always carried a switchblade in his cowboy boots. But the police apparently didn't like any of those nicknames because they always referred to James as Whitey after his whitish blonde hair. As a kid, Whitey's parents knew right away that he was different. Like when he was 10 years old, he literally lived out every child's dream of running away with the circus. Barnum and Bailey had been in town and he briefly ran away with them. But after a quick stint with the clowns, Whitey knew he was destined for so much more. The Bolger family grew up in South Boston projects where Whitey was described by the neighbors as a dangerous delinquent. He got into a bunch of vicious fights, wild car chases, and often ran around with his crew known as the Shamrocks. Yo, that sounds like the name of a kindergarten soccer team or something. The Shamrocks? Like, how menacing. Whitey dropped out of high school before he could finish, but that didn't surprise his classmates. They said he was someone who always had a car while everyone was just taking the bus. Is that his classmates' way of subtly hinting that he stole the car? Because if so, I love the pettiness of that. Whitey's life of crime began at an early age. When he was just 14, he was arrested for stealing. And while after that, his criminal record would continue to escalate until it was as long as a CVS receipt. Now that's, that's a lot. He was arrested for larceny, forgery, assault and battery, and armed robbery, all before he was old enough to be tried as an adult. He served five years in juvie for his crimes, and as soon as he got out, he joined the Air Force. But somehow, not even the Air Force could whip Whitey into shape, because as soon as he joined the force, he had a big falling out with the authorities and ended up serving time in military jail for assault. Despite all of this, Whitey was honorably discharged in 1952, so as it turns out, apparently you can be a shit person and still get an honorable discharge. Imagine that. His crimes began to escalate, resulting in a bunch of bank robberies from Rhode Island all the way down to Indiana. And in June of 1956, he was eventually caught and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Whitey was first sent to a federal prison in Atlanta, but got caught making plans to escape, so he got carted off to Alcatraz. Apparently, Whitey really enjoyed his time in Alcatraz. In an interview in 2011, Whitey said that if he could choose the epitaph on his tombstone, it would say, I'd rather be in Alcatraz. That would be a really good bumper sticker. Hello? Whitey served only nine years of his 25 year sentence and when he was released, he got right back to doing what he did best. And that was breaking the law. He became an enforcer for a famous crime boss named Donald Killeen. And at one point, a group war erupted between Killeen's crew and their rivals, the Mullins, and this is when one of the most infamous stories about Whitey took place. In the middle of the crossfire, Donald was struck, and at some point, a guy named Mickey got his nose bitten off. Yeesh. No one knows who actually did the biting, but when you talk to Whitey, you're bound to hear someone ask, isn't that the guy who bit someone's nose off? After Donald was executed in 1972, Whitey left his crew and joined the Winter Hill Group where he quickly rose in rank. By 1979, Whitey was one of the most famous dudes in Boston organized crime scene. When the Winter Hill leader was sentenced to prison for fixing horse races, Whitey assumed the role of the head honcho. He had a terrorizing presence in the South Boston area and people were very afraid of him. When a couple decided to open a store in an old gas station where Whitey had his eye for a new meetup spot, Whitey and his crew literally showed up at the couple's house and threatened them. He asked the couple how much they wanted for the store and when the duo said it wasn't for sale, Whitey's triggerman pulled out his Glock and set it all on the table. The couple's young daughter wandered into the room at this point and Whitey's sidekick picked her up and put her on his lap and started tossing her hair. This little girl noticed the Glock, picked it up, and started to play with it. She even put it in her mouth at one point and the sidekick just smiled at the couple like, isn't she cute? Well, after that terrifying situation, the couple got freaked out enough to sell the store to Whitey and his crew for $67,000, even though they initially paid $100,000 for it. And at this store is where another famous Whitey story emerged. Apparently this guy was walking around Whitey's store one day when he turned a corner and bumped into Whitey. He said the cold, hard glare that Whitey gave him was enough to make him soil his pants. From the mid 1970s to the mid 1990s, Whitey and his pals would have control over a significant amount of Boston's illicit substance scene. 
They also ran multiple illegal gambling and loaning operations. During the 16 year period where the crimes of his crew flourished, Whitey was keeping a huge secret from everyone. He was an FBI informant. Unbeknownst to even his closest of buddies, Whitey was helping bring down some of the biggest organized crime families in the country while also building up an even bigger and more powerful crime network of his own. Now apparently Whitey's brother William was a member of the Massachusetts State Senate and Whitey was able to take advantage of that. He also had a bunch of friends from childhood who became members of the police force and Whitey knew how to work them. Whitey was pretty good at his gig too. He actually helped the FBI bring down one of the biggest organized crime families in all of New England, the Patriarchas. And all the while he remained one of the most dangerous and active mob bosses on the East Coast. Sorry, Special Agent John. How much longer is this gonna take? I've got a guy's nose I was planning to bite off at two o'clock and I really can't afford to reschedule. In 1994, the DEA and state police launched an investigation into Whitey's gambling and loaning operation. Whitey and his partner in crime were charged, but Whitey was able to slip away with his girlfriend, Teresa. Apparently, Whitey had caught word from his FBI handler and longtime friend, Special Agent John Connolly that he was going to be indicted so he and Teresa skipped town as fast as they could. Teresa realized that the hashtag criminal life wasn't really for her and a month later she returned back home with Whitey so that she could be with her kids. As soon as that was settled, Whitey picked up and fled again. This time he bounced with his new mistress Catherine and at one point he became the second most wanted man only after Osama bin Laden. Oh my God, I wonder what his parents would think of that. Like, I'm sure they had hopes of their kid making the Dean's List or the Forbes 30 Under 30 List or something, but not the FBI's top 10 most wanted. Okay, so officials wanted to catch Whitey really bad. So a $1 million reward was issued for any information that could lead to his arrest. And in 2011, Whitey's life on the run finally came to the end when the FBI was tipped off about his location. He was caught and arrested in Santa Monica, California, when I first read that, I actually thought it was a typo. The guy was born in 1929 and was still on the run up until the year Party Rock Anthem came out. That's unreal. Well, the 16 year manhunt was finally over. The tipster who helped lead to Whitey's arrest notified the FBI that the 81 year old man was living in an apartment complex with his mistress, Catherine. And I guess the snitch who ratted Whitey out hit the lotto with that tip since there was $1 million on the line. But I wonder if the tipster was scared of being whacked by one of Whitey's past crew members or something. Whitey could even have a hardcore fan club who was pissed off by the person who got their king arrested. Okay, I've been watching too many crime shows. I can literally turn anything into the most intricate theory, but let's get back to the task at hand, Whitey's arrest. After the FBI got the inside scoop on Whitey's location, they went to his pad and got the manager of the building to ask Whitey to come down to the garage of the complex because the lock on the storage locker was broken. But as soon as Whitey came down, the FBI agent swarmed and arrested him. Eventually, Whitey gave up and told the FBI, you know who I am, I'm Whitey Bulger. Yeah, I feel like I give up on that point too. I mean, come on, the guy was in his 80s. Inside Whitey and Catherine's apartment, police found 30 firearms, a bunch of knives, some ammunition, and over $822,000 in cash. And did I mention, most of all this stuff was found in the walls. Catherine was also captured and arrested. And in March of 2012, she pleaded guilty for harboring a fugitive and was sentenced to eight years in prison. In 2013, Whitey went to trial and faced a 32 count indictment, which included money laundering, extortion, illicit substance dealing, corrupting FBI and other law enforcement officials and participating in 19 executions. In 2013, after a two month trial, Whitey was found guilty on 31 counts and received two life sentences. During Whitey's sentencing, the judge told him the scope, the callousness, the depravity of your crimes are almost unfathomable. On October 30th, 2018, Whitey was found unresponsive in his cell after he had been beaten by other inmates at a U.S. penitentiary in West Virginia. He passed away at 89 years old. And finally, Whitey Bulger's reign of terror was over. And while Whitey's career of crime might have been over, the stories that have emerged about him after his passing have continued to paint a picture of one of the most interesting lives ever lived. In 2020, an interview with one of the jurors from Whitey's trial was published. The interview detailed a more sad, complex life than Whitey had previously let on. The juror came forward and said she regretted voting to convict Bulger after he'd written 70 letters to her from prison. In the letters, Whitey talked about the time he spent in prison for his initial bank robberies and described his unwilling participation in a secret CIA experiment with LSD. That's right. Because if running away with the circus at age 10 isn't ridiculous enough, our boy had a brush with MKUltra. 
So something that Whitey's lawyers never brought up in the trial was that when Whitey was finishing out his first prison sentence in the late 1950s, the CIA dosed him with the hallucinogen over 50 times. They were in a desperate search for a mind control substance and used Whitey and a bunch of other inmates as guinea pigs. But the CIA didn't tell them about the mind control part of the experiment. They told inmates it was a way to find the cure for schizophrenia and bribe them into participating by offering reduced sentences. And if you don't already think that's crazy, wait until you hear this. Apparently Whitey hadn't taken anyone's life up until his first prison sentence where he participated in the MK Ultra trials. So a lot of people, including Whitey's juror pen pal, believed the substances messed with his brain and made him into this famous predator. On the flip side of this narrative, a formal federal prosecutor gave some insight on why the MK Ultra bit was not used in trial. He said that jurors could sometimes be swayed more by morality than legality. And if the jurors heard that the government loaded Whitey up with hallucinogens, used him as an FBI informant, and then went after him in a big manhunt, it would start to overshadow the ruthless criminal that Whitey really was, potentially swaying some of the jurors. So was he a misunderstood man that was ruined by some government experiment? Well, I feel like the more we continue to find out more about this guy, the more we'll never know. And that is just a taste of the wildlife of Whitey Bulger. The dude lived a long crime riddled life and his passing marked the end of an era of crazy crimes and terrible nicknames. Oh, and I can just smell how good this falafel pita is going to be. So I think I'm gonna get going and enjoy this while my nose continues to remain intact. We'll see you next time.